welcome to worship at Bethlehem Lutheran Church, wherever you find yourself at today and whenever you find yourself joining us. Know that you are welcome to be a part of this worshiping community. As a community, we are called to help each other know and experience the goodness and grace of God. And so in this time of social distancing, we will continue to offer services in an online format so that you might be blessed and be reminded that you are loved by God as you are for who you are. If you are worshiping with us for the first time today and you are willing, I would invite you to let us know that in the comment section so that we can officially welcome you into the life of this community. Also, if you are aware of family and friends who may not have a worshiping community and you would like them to experience this and to know that they are loved by God, then please share this service with them. We would encourage you to do that. Our service begins as we gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, we pray that in the midst of all of the changes that we are experiencing in life, that you would make yourself known to us in the love, support, and grace we experience from others. Help us to experience the life that comes from following in your way. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading is from Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. In Athens, Paul faces the challenge of proclaiming the gospel to Greeks who know nothing of either Jewish or Christian tradition. He proclaims that the unknown God whom they worship is the true Lord of heaven and earth who will judge the world with justice through Jesus, whom God has raised from the dead. The reading begins at verse 22. Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the place where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your poets have said. For we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have his the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13-22. through 22. The author of 1 Peter encourages Christians to remain faithful even in the face of defamation and persecution. In baptism, we are made clean to act in accordance with what is right. The reading begins at verse 13. Who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey. When God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the buildings of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Families, if you have children who are not currently present in your worshiping space, now is the time to call them in as we experience another Matt and Chad adventure. just tired. Kids are still at home. There's this, you know, quarantine that's still happening. Yeah. Life is hard. I'm not really happy. Um, mm. And on top of that, I don't even feel my, my faith life just stinks. I don't see, too bad. feel, sense God. Is that bad? Well, yeah, that's a problem. Oh, thought so. But I can train you to have more faith. What can I do? It's gonna to be tough. Are you in? Can you do it? Sure. It's gonna to take toughness. It's gonna to take greasy lightning chicken speed. You're gonna to have to work day and night, but I can train you to have more faith. Okay. Why am I on the floor? What are we doing? In order to increase your faith, You've got to know the hymns. you got to know the hymns, Rock. Oh. First off, I'm going to name some hymns for you. You're going to have to tell me what the hymn is. If you get it wrong, you're going to do a push-up. Uh-oh. Hymn number 317. Amazing Grace. Wrong. It's Jesus on the mountain peak. <laughs> uh. In order to increase your faith, you've got to prepare the cups. Prepare the cups for the people. On your marks, get set. Go, Rock, go! Come on there, Rock. You got that. You can do that. Faster. Faster. The people are coming. Hymn number 379. What is it? Um, an Easter song. Wrong. It's now the green blade rising. I'm surprised you didn't know that one. All right, come on, Jack. Come on, Rock. You got this. You got this. More faster. Come on. You got it. Almost. Oh, you broke one. Oh, okay. Number 377. Go tell it on the mountain. Wrong. Hallelujah. Jesus is risen. In order to increase your faith, Rock, you got to get in the Word. You got to get in the Scriptures and do some reading. Get in there and read some Bible Scriptures. Not fast enough. These people. Oh, who cares? It doesn't matter. Just keep reading it, Rock. Just keep reading it. Oh, you're breaking them now. You're breaking them. Prepare the cops for the people. You read it and it'll increase their faith. Why are, why are so many people begetting so many people? Oh, blessed spring. Come on, it's a favorite of all of ours. Oh, oh. In order to increase your faith, Rock, you gotta bring the light to the people. You gotta prepare the worship space, Rock. So I got the candles, and the candles, and the lighter, and the, the, the matches. You gotta run down there as fast as you can, and light those candles. It's like you're an altar boy. Come on, abide in the word, abide in it, abide in that word, Rock. Two hands, chicken speed, chicken speed. Come on, Rock, come on. I don't know, just keep reading it, just keep reading it. Are you ready to bring the light to the people? On your marks, get set, go, Jack, go! Oh, don't run, the walk, walk, Jack. Walk slow, walk faster, walk. Almost there, Jack, almost there. Bring that light, bring that light. Yeah, all right, that's good, Jack, yeah, that's good, boy, that's good. Come on, you need to read four more. Come on, come on, you 
that's the welcome pad. You gotta welcome people. Ready? Go! Welcome them, welcome them. That's good, that's good, right? Come on. You gotta get up. Oh. Get those off. Grab them again. Grab them again. Do it again. Up and down the stairs, right? You gotta bring that off. You need to abide more. Come on. I'm almost there, Jerry. I'm there. Bring that light. Bring that light. Yeah. All right. That's good, Gary. Yes. Some good work. I'm exhausted. Yeah, it's pretty tiring. It's pretty tiring. That was a lot of stuff. Come to think of it, how is this supposed to increase my faith? the point of that? I don't know. I just thought it'd be good for the episode. <laughs> As people's lives have been turned upside down and everyone is having just a little too much family time, I noticed on my social media feeds more opinion pieces saying that a strong, deep faith is supposed to make all this easier. Well, that might be true to some extent, but I don't know about that. The story of our faith is not something tangible. It's not something you can touch, collect, store, or hoard. So you can't exactly go out and buy more of it. It's not following a checklist or a set of have-tos. It's not a set of goals you can train for and achieve if you just try hard enough. It's not a feeling. The story of our faith is about God's love for the world, apart from how we are feeling at any given point in time. And it's an invitation to live connected to God by following the path of Jesus, the path of forgiveness, compassion, and love. We remind ourselves of this every time we worship together. So parents, if you are stressed out, irritated, frustrated with kids, feeling like you're going to explode, it's not that you don't have enough faith and should try desperately to get more. Life is hard. But the story of our faith reminds us that God walks with us, cares for us, loves us, regardless of whether we can see, sense, or feel it. Remind yourself of this. Remind your kids of this. Gospel according to John, the 14th chapter. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides in you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. 
In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When John wrote his Gospel, he zeroed in on the way Jesus connects us with God and to each other. John recalls Jesus' words about love probably more than any other of the gospel writers. And he describes an intimacy between the believer in Christ Jesus. It's an intimacy that can be only understood by those who love Jesus. Today's gospel reading takes us right there, where love and God's presence meet and as I thought about communicating today, I kept coming back to my own experience with the Gospel of John. You just can't hurry through it. It's like walking through a garden. Um, you need to walk slowly, not hurry through. And even though John's words are simple, not what they describe is simple. You need to take your time with them. So today I'd like to be a little bit more like a teacher and invite you to reflect with me as we hear Jesus describe love and God's presence with us. That is for believers. God loves all people, but those who are not open to Jesus or who maybe even actively reject what he brings, um, these words will make no sense at all. However, they do and they will for those who open their hearts and lives to him. So I'd like to focus on two things. One I'll call the love connection and taking up residence in our lives. And I'd like to begin with what I'll call the love connection, because twice in that gospel, if you noticed, Jesus connects love and obedience. Again, I'm going to read them slowly, these two sentences, and I'd invite you to be aware of a word or a phrase that uh, jumps out at you, that speaks to you as you listen. I'll read slowly. Jesus says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And then he also says, Whoever has my commandments and obeys them, she or he is the one who loves me. I like uh, Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of this in his uh, paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. It, it goes like this. If you love me, show it by doing what I told you. <laughs> it says it pretty clearly. And he also says, the person who knows my commandments and keeps them, that's the one who loves me. What phrase spoke to you? For me, it was the two words, love and obey. And as I think about them, I think they, they mean more than maybe they do the first time we hear it. So I'd like to picture that for you. I want you to picture a cross. Um... Of course, when we look at a cross, the first thing we think about is the death of Jesus. But we also begin to think, because it's become that for us, 
we begin to think about the love of Christ for us. And you'll notice that when you look at the cross, it, it, it points in a vertical direction and a horizontal direction. And the first direction, which is vertical, speaks of God's love for us and Jesus' work to reconcile us with our maker. Here we're talking about the forgiveness of sins. We're talking about life that is given in him, eternal life. And of course, those are only gifts that God can give, but the motivation for them is the, uh, is the word in Greek, the word for love, agape. And that simply means that you're giving it, your motivation for giving it is simply because you love the ones you're giving to and there's no fee charged. That's where we remember, of course, the, the, the well-known Bible verse, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This vertical dimension of our faith. But as you look at the cross, you also see it pointing horizontally. And we think here of our world, our relationships with each other. In fact, from that cross, Jesus even asked the Father to forgive them, his enemies, for they knew not what they were doing. This is a uh, an important part of Christ's love that focuses on love for the neighbor, love for ourselves. It's the second purpose in Jesus' love through the cross, and that's that we are reconciled with each other, that we live out with each other the love of God. And we see that close connection between the vertical and the horizontal if you just look at a, a little look at the at the cross where the beams cross that's a powerful symbol because it's like a crossroads god's redeeming love for us and among us for each other and and here to me is the big takeaway from this scripture we just can't speak of Jesus without using the language of love. So when Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments, which are incidentally to love. And he says it the other way too. Those who obey my commandments are those who love me. We are hearing that you can't separate the love of God and the love of others. They're of a peace. That's what Jesus is all about. And so love ends up becoming the most important fruit that comes from Christ. And I think in this day and age, it helps us to discern uh, real faith and counterfeit faith, to be honest. Real faith is going to seek to love. It doesn't always succeed, but it's in the striving. And it knows that that's not negotiable. Counterfeit faith likes to stand behind the image of the faith and use some of the faith's teachings to motivate, but oftentimes the motivation is anger, sometimes even hatred. It's trying to mobilize people and maybe even control them. And sometimes it can take very ugly forms. Sometimes it can be more subtle. But what we learn to recognize is something that Jesus told his disciples because there are all false teachers out there. He said, you'll know them by their fruits. A good tree will produce good fruit. A relationship with Jesus Christ 
that's authentic will begin to evidence the fruits of love. But one of the reasons why we can yearn for and hope to become more loving is that we don't simply have a teaching here, somebody telling us love. My goodness, we have plenty of teachings in this world. God takes up residence in the lives of those who believe. And here we get to the second promise of Jesus, that he promises that we will be given uh, through the Holy Spirit uh, something that is, is like his living presence with us and in us. Uh, so again, I would like to read this slowly and ask you to think about the words that I read and uh, what is a phrase or something that may jump out at you. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, the spirit of truth. Eugene Peterson uses the word friend. I will give you another friend, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. What word or phrase struck you? Now, I understand that, that what I just read, this promise, would to somebody looking outside say, that just sounds like fantasy. And fantasy, of course, is something that uh, we all do. And it's absolutely delightful in younger children. Uh, my, uh, my grandson, Johnny, who's four years old, has very active imagination. And he has an imaginary friend. Um, her name is Huxley, and uh, she uh, can do anything. She has superpowers, but when you see her, she's simply a blanket. So he carries Huxley around, and, and then he'll tell me endless stories about what Huxley does and what did, and then guess what happened? And it's just so delightful. And of course, that's something very, very common among kids. But we know as adults that if we continue to believe those fantasies, uh, life would not work for us very well. And when that continues in a serious way, you know, we're dealing with mental illness and living life really breaks down. If what Jesus is describing is fantasy or self-delusion, then you have to account for how that sense of the spirit in somebody's life motivates giants like Mother Teresa or uh, Martin Luther King or Billy Graham, who would believe this deeply, that the presence of God was in them. When I uh, hear this, the thing that uh, came out for me was spirit of truth. And I actually read this to a group this week and asked them, and many of them also resonated to that phrase, spirit of truth, um, as, a, as one of the ways of describing this advocate or this friend, this spirit that is given to us, that also reveals to us the, the presence of Jesus, not the historical figure, but the presence of Jesus living in us. And uh, we speak here, obviously, of the Holy Spirit that's given to us as, at baptism. But one of the things you notice about John is he does not speak of the Spirit as a thing or an it, uh, but actually as a person. And that's because what we understand in Scripture is our best way of understanding what God is to us is not as a, a, a force, but as a person. Up close and personal. A friend. And um, 
Among the attributes of the Spirit that I, I resonate to is, is the idea that it's of truth. I think we all feel, many of us feel at least, that the world in which we live in right now is, is um, it's hard to know what the truth is. And there are reasons for that. Um, lying has become much more socially acceptable, so we speak of post-truth culture. One, the most helpful thing I heard about that is when lying is constant, the problem isn't spotting the lie so much as it is, finally, it's harder to recognize the truth. And so the idea that the spirit of truth comes into the human being, assaulted as we are by untruth. In fact, when we speak of Satan or the evil one, we call him father of lies, father of confusion, distortion. Uh, and the idea that God's presence within us functions as truth helps us discern what is right and what is good. It doesn't make us, as some would almost pretend, that we somehow now know everything. That's something that Martin Luther once time said was, uh, some people think they swallowed the Holy Spirit feathers and all. We aren't given those kinds of powers, but, but given time and given growth, we do come to understanding what's right and good, and that's part of what we experience when we experience peace, that we are in the right relationship, that we are in obedience, that we are proceeding in a manner that God can honor. On a practical basis, the time-tested ways of making this daily for us are prayer, dwelling in the word, seeking community with others who share our faith, and then looking for specific actions that we do actions of love, ways of following Jesus' commandments to love one another as I have loved you. A hopeful, encouraging, and challenging message for our day. Amen.
Thank you for the many ways in which you participate in the life of this community. We do not have to be in the same room to be the church. The ways that you care for your family, the ways that you reach out to your community and the world, the, those ways speak of the love of God. Thank you for supporting our ministry, which has transformed in this time to meet the needs of where people are at. Your financial gifts make it possible for us to continue to reach out to our community, to continue our faith formation, and to continue to bring worship in meaningful and creative ways. We now receive our tithes and offerings and hear an offering of music. Pray for the church, for the world, and for all people who have needs. Almighty God, send your guiding spirit to help unite your church on earth, to heal its wounds and to mend its brokenness, so that your church may clearly reflect the kingdom of God, welcoming all in Christ's name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, as followers of Christ, open our eyes to see the needs of the world and move us as your servants to do your will. Where there are hungry people in this world, help us to be generous with what we have. When people feel helpless and oppressed, give us the courage to speak out. In places that are torn apart by war, help us to work for peace and well-being. And wherever there is intolerance, Allow us to treat each other as your children. Gracious God, in this time of pandemic, help us to look to those who are suffering with care and mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Almighty God, give healing to all those people who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. Come to the aid of those that call on you. Especially today, we remember before you, Salva Sirka, Lillian Johannes, Jake Rodriguez, Bonnie Larson, Lauren Magsum, Jolene Perkins, Ellie and Aria Hammond, Darlene Cook, David Morin, and those that we name in the silence of our hearts. Gracious God, grant these individuals named and unnamed healing, even if they cannot be cured. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for those who are grieving this day. We especially remember the Hoy family as they mourn the loss of Bob. Give them comfort and peace in this time of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, be with all of those who are away from their families and loved ones. Be with those who are in the midst of life transitions and new experiences. We ask that you guide their paths. And bless the various ministries, gifts, and talents of each person in this congregation, that they may use them in service towards you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All this and whatever else you see that we need, we pray in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. receive God's blessing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Abide in God's peace. Thanks be to God. Get to